A couple of weeks ago, we had some real storms here in San Diego. Pouring rain, lightning, hail, incredibly strong winds. One night during this time, I was sitting on my couch by my front window at around 9 p.m. The rain had stopped, although it had been pouring for the past few days. I can't remember what precisely I was doing at exactly that moment, but I remember what I at first took to be the boom of thunder. I thought it must be close because it seemed like it shook the house a bit as well. But after a minute or two, I wondered if it was really thunder because it seemed like something was a bit off. My next door neighbors were leaving their house with flashlights and when I looked out my window into the darkened street, something was different about the view. So I grabbed my own flashlight and had it outside as well. And in the dim light, I could just make out the fact that I was right. Something was different. The view that I had grown so accustomed to, the view that I loved, was gone. One of my jack o trees outside my front yard had been knocked over by the wind into the street, where it used to be, where what used to be a graceful, mature tree was now just upturned roots and broken branches and an obstacle completely blocking the road. Not only that, it had also taken down part of a power line with it, which is why the street was so dark and my neighbors had no light. I mean, very luckily, no one had gotten hurt and it hadn't hit anything else. I was very grateful for that. But as a new homeowner, this was a new experience for me. I mean, I've never had to deal with something like this before. And so the subsequent calls to the sheriff's office and to the tree removal people were all new. But in another way, something about this experience felt all too familiar. The landscape that I had grown accustomed to had suddenly changed in the blink of an eye. Something I had expected to always be there was now uprooted. It feels, honestly, it feels an, like an apt metaphor for this moment, doesn't it? At least it does to me. Although we're now 11 months into this crazy pandemic, it still sometimes takes me by surprise how much things have changed. It's like walking past that spot in my front yard, expecting to see a tree, but seeing a hole instead. Over the past few weeks, We've started to hear some good news coming from our medical professionals. Hopeful news, at least. The stay-at-home order we had over the holidays has been lifted. And while we still have a long way to go, it seems as though the numbers are finally moving in the right direction. People are hopeful. People are getting vaccinated, and as I mentioned in the announcements and in our newsletter, just a note that we are going to be having a frequently asked questions about the vaccination process on Wednesday at 6.30. Um, the link will be on Facebook. It's also in our newsletter with our very own Chris Annunciato, a church member, nurse, pra nurse practitioner, um, who's happy to answer any questions. So if you've got questions about the whole vaccination thing, please um, mention them in the comments or send us emails directly and we'll try and answer them. But as a whole, as a whole, there's some hope about getting out of the darkest corner of this pandemic. Hope that the numbers will continue to drop and we'll be past the worst of it. But friends, I have both good news and bad news for you this morning. The bad news is something you probably already suspect, although it might take a little while for it to fully sink in for all of us. Although I know many of us have said we can't wait for things to go back to normal. Unfortunately, we can't actually turn back the clock and live in the time before the pandemic. Something significant has shifted. The landscape is no longer the same. There are losses we cannot get back. Graduations that cannot be redone. First days of college that cannot be relived empty spots of the dining room table that cannot be filled. What was has been uprooted. 
When we face that reality head on, there's a lot of feelings that can come with it. Grief in what's been lost, exhaustion and overwhelm, anxiety about the changes. What do we do when what was has been uprooted? Over the next eight weeks, we're going to dive deep into one particular book of the Bible, the Gospel of John, to see how a particular community of faith answered this question and to see how we might answer this question. Although we don't know for certain exactly when this Gospel was written, most scholars believe it was the last Gospel to be written and compiled. John was younger than the other disciples and, tradition has it, lived the longest. He would have experienced during his lifetime several significant moments of upheaval. But one in particular was especially catastrophic, uprooting everything. Life for Jews in Jerusalem had been growing increasingly difficult. In 63 BC, a Roman general by the name of Pompey captured Jerusalem and set up a puppet king and made sure that he would tax the people to keep the Roman coffers full kept enough soldiers nearby to make sure that their presence was felt by the Jewish population. Just over a hundred years later, in 66 AD, tensions between Jews and Gentiles and resentment over the oppressive government boiled over. Jewish forces revolted and pushed the Romans out of Jerusalem. At first, the Jewish population were ecstatic. They had reclaimed Jerusalem. But Rome wasn't gone for good. The Roman emperor at the time, Nero, sent additional forces in to squash the rebellion. And in 70 AD, during the time of the Jewish Passover, as an aside, the same time that Jesus was in Jerusalem and had been crucified 40 years before, Roman forces surrounded Jerusalem. They let the pilgrims in for Passover, but then didn't let them out. Food ran out. Water ran out. People starved. Jerusalem couldn't withstand the siege and fell. And the Romans wiped out the population and burnt the temple to the ground. It might be a little easier for us this year to imagine the shockwaves that that destruction caused. And the shock was twofold. First, a shock that comes with any traumatic event like war, but then second, a shock of a destruction of a way of life. This city, this temple. You see, the temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish religious life. It was the holiest site in all of Israel, a place where God had consecrated and blessed it, God's self. Many of the religious festivals and events were centered on the temple. Pilgrims from all over the nation would gather at the temple for Passover, Jesus one of them. But in 70 AD, the central Jewish place of worship was not just closed, but wiped out. We've been navigating the loss of access to our physical church location over the past almost year, and it has been hard. It's exciting for me to be here in my office, close. And we know that the building is still there and we have hope that we'll be able to gather again soon. But not so for them. Imagine for them the shock, their temple burnt to the ground. A whole way of life suddenly uprooted. In times of chaos and challenge, of change and uncertainty, things that made sense in the world as it was before, might suddenly be called into question. How do we keep our faith? Can God still be trusted? What type of God would let these things happen? Is God angry with me, with with us? Has God abandoned us? For the earliest Christian communities, the destruction of the temple would have been a perspective-shifting event and shocking, but, but it wasn't the only one. A second major challenge would come for these early Christian communities when the disciples and apostles, eyewitnesses to the person of Jesus Christ, started to die. 
Tradition has it that John was the last to die and perhaps even lived into his 90s. I imagine John as a wise elder in the community whose stories included what it was like to actually be with Jesus. I would have loved to hear him describing what following him was like, walking along the dusty roads with him, eating and drinking and talking with him. Imagine asking him questions about the miraculous things he witnessed. He was there. But the early Christian community that grew in those early days, as eyewitnesses share their testimony, faced a challenge. The eyewitnesses like John didn't last forever. Faith had a pass from one generation to the next. In times of chaos and challenge, of change and uncertainty, how do we keep not just our own faith, but pass it on? You know, I've been thinking about this phrase lately, passing on faith. And it struck me that it can have two meanings. To pass on faith could mean to share it with others, but to pass on faith could also mean to give it a pass, to say, nope, that's not for me. That might have worked for you, but I'm going a different direction. And I know many parents and grandparents who have spoken to me, who have wrestled with this challenge of passing on faith. Something that has been so core and important to you that you've wanted to pass on to the next generation, but for some reason, they say pass to the opportunity. For those of us wanting to pass on our faith to others, we face the same challenge of these early Christian communities. In times of chaos and challenge, of change and uncertainty, how do we not just keep our own faith, but pass it on. Keeping our faith, passing it on. In the Gospel of John, we see some of the same questions and challenges emerge that we're facing today. But we also see John point to an answer. It's an answer that might be somewhat unexpected, captured in a phrase that we find twice in the very first chapter. So let's turn to the story and see if we can catch it. I invite you to grab your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, the very first chapter. John starts off his Gospel with a big, universe-wide picture. In the beginning was the Word, he writes, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We hear echoes of creation in this introduction, a reminder of a God who's created the universe and everything that's in it. In him was life, John continues, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When light comes into a room, the contrast can make the darkness all the more stark. When our world has been uprooted, we may sometimes ask, where is God? Has God forgotten me? Or even more insidious, has God given up on me? Has God decided that I am too broken or too sinful or have too much darkness? Has God turned God's face away? John goes on. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus has made God known. This is a core declaration of the Gospel of John, the core of John's faith, the witness that he's proclaiming. You see Jesus, you have seen the Father. Do you have questions about who God is, how God feels about the world, how God feels about you? Look to Jesus. Do you want to find some clarity in the midst of a world in chaos? Look to Jesus. I use the words, look to Jesus, but John offers a slightly different invitation. This phrase I invited us to listen for before. And as chapter one continues, the gospel writer moves from the universe-wide big picture to narrow in on the story of encounters with Jesus. Let's take a look. In John 1, 35 through 46. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. 
And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following. What do you want? He asked. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John's testimony and followed Jesus. He first found his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah, which is translated as Christ. Andrew brought him to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to set out for Galilee. Finding Philip, he told him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the same town as Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the one the prophets foretold, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. Come and see. Here it is. The invitation for those of us wrestling to keep our faith or those wondering how we can pass it on. The disciples asked Jesus a simple question. Where are you staying? But he doesn't just answer with a word or statement, but with an invitation to join him. Come and see, he says. One disciple, Philip, is so amazed by who he has met that he finds his friend Nathaniel and makes an incredible claim. We have found the one. And Nathaniel is skeptical. Really? A nobody from nowhere is the one? And in reply, Philip doesn't try to convince him with facts or figures or statements or quotes. He simply says, come and see. Come and see. Over the course of the next two months, we're going to extend this invitation to you and invite you to extend this invitation to others. Each week, we'll be sharing testimonies from church members who have had an encounter with this risen Jesus. We want to thank Sister Emma so much for starting us off and if you have a testimony that you'd like to share, please let us know in the comments below or by emailing me or calling me directly. We also want to encourage you to use these next two months to spend some really quality time in this book of the Bible, this Gospel of John. Next week, we'll be sharing a story from John chapter 2. So we invite you to spend some time in this next week with these first two chapters. Perfectly take note of the encounters people have with Jesus. What do you notice? What does Jesus say to them? What might Jesus want to say to you or me this week? Friends, we may be living in a season of rapid change where the landscape feels like it's shifted dramatically. But this is not the first time storms have arisen. If you've struggled with keeping your faith in this time of upheaval or passing your faith to others, we extend this invitation. Come and see. Let us look together on Jesus. If you'll bow your heads with me for prayer. Our gracious God, in this time of change and challenge, we thank you for this invitation. Come and see who you are. Come and look to Jesus, encounter him. And as the testimony of John proclaims, our lives will not be the same. We pray for each person who hears these words. We pray that they hear this invitation and that they say, 
Yes. I will take a look. I will follow. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen.